We're spending an entire year studying four epistles to understand the good news of God. And here's what we understand the good news of the gospel is. It's the power of God to save us from the power and punishment of sin so that we have peace with God, peace within, and peace with others. And when we experience that, it changes our capacity to experience the power of God at work, especially through his word. Right now we're studying the book of Ephesians in this series, The Good News Revealed, and we're understanding the good news of God allows believers to know the plans and desires that God has revealed for his people. Anyone can read the Bible, even the text we're going to teach on today. You, you can possibly understand the concepts, but if you're not a born-again believer filled with the Spirit of God, there's going to be parts of this that are not going to resonate in your heart, and it's understandable. You're not born again. But those who are born again, there is something very, very strong that should happen in your heart today as we consider the truth of God's Word, and I pray that it does. Everyone believes something. Everyone here, everyone you know, believes in something they believe is right and true. And that's their gospel. That's their good news. And, and, and it's very important to realize that's going to affect all of your life. Here's what we say. Many of you can say it with me. The gospel you believe determines the life that you live and the emotions you feel is determined by the gospel you believe. I believe in the gospel with my whole heart. And I have peace with God and I have peace within. And as far as it is up to me, I have peace with others. I've been a believer now since 1988, June 28th, 1988. Christ took over my life. I've been in the ordained ministry now coming up this August for 30 years. And I must admit to you, I'm not as far as long as I thought I would be at this point. There are still things I struggle with that I, I didn't think I'd keep struggling this way. There, there are parts of the ministry I thought surely I would be better at by now, but it's still a challenge for me. It's, it's, still, very, it's still very difficult for me. And, and here's what I've come to realize, uh, uh, and it's true of not just me, it's, it's true of all believers, is we're all battling. We're all struggling. It's, it's, it's hard on everybody. And our text today is going to help us understand why. Today, we're going to see in our text why it is life is so challenging and how God's weapons for spiritual warfare revealed can help us. Now, this is, this is something I believe. This is a combination of Plato and Thoreau. And I believe this to be true. Almost everyone you meet is fighting a battle in quiet desperation. We're all having a hard time about something. What I love about being a Christian and what I love about the Word of God and what I'm so grateful is it pertains to the Spirit of God is that we have a capacity to, to live in a victory that has been won. And we can understand what's going on in us and around us so that we can, we can face the battle that we are in under the authority of Jesus Christ and accomplish his purpose in the midst of it. If you've got your Bible, and I hope that you do, let's go now to the book of Ephesians. This is, this is the book we're walking through. Believe it or not, we will be done with this next week. Again, we've, we have flown through this thing. The first week in August, we're going to be rejoicing in the Lord. We're going to be in uh, Philippians, where 16 times uh, we are told to rejoice. But, but today we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. You should be in Ephesians chapter 6. Our text is verses 10 through 20. Wesley's going to come and read verses 10 through 12. Let's all stand together in honor of God's word. Again, we're in Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, Wesley's going to read 10 through 12. Go ahead. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. Amen. Well done, Wesley. If you would be seated and pray now for the, the preaching of God's word. We, we live in a broken world, and I don't know many who want to argue that point. Our world is filled with, with sadness and suffering and dissatisfaction. And, and that is a result of brokenness. When we, when we talk about reality, we use three circles to help us understand what's going on. And we understand that the world is broken. We are born without peace with God, without peace with them, without peace with others. And so long as that is the case, there's always going to be sadness and suffering and dissatisfaction. But that's not the way God made us to be. The reason why it's so challenging and difficult is because 
When God created all things, he made them in harmony. God's design is harmony. And why this is so hard is because we were not made for a world like this. We were made for a world where we have peace with God, peace within, peace with others. But that's, that's not naturally what is happening. There, there is pain and suffering in the world. Why? Well, because of sin. Because sin has entered the world. And because there is sin, there is brokenness. And in brokenness, there is sadness and suffering. And there is dissatisfaction. Now, this God, this great God, who loves us and created all things to be in harmony, he existed before anything else did. It's important from time to time to think about what was before there was anything. And there was and there is and there always will be God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as God, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in eternity past and will reign in eternity future and now reigns over all, there is, there is this one reality that reigns in the existence of their identity and in their relationship to one another as one God and three persons. And that is this. This is John, I'm sorry, 1 John 4, 16. Here's the reality of our God. God, say it with me. God is, he is love. Before anything else was made, there was God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit wrapped in love. This God was completely satisfied in and of himself. This God had the bliss of perfect love, perfect delight, perfect praise, complete satisfaction as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God did not need us. He was completely satisfied in and of himself. But for his glory and according to his purpose, God created all things and he spoke them into creation. This is Genesis chapter one, beginning in verse one. In the beginning, as things began, as there was space and, and time and matter, there was God. And God created, and this word created, the Hebrew, Hebrew word there is, um, is a word that means uh, to create out of nothing. We as human beings, we create with something. God created out of nothing. There was nothing except God in perfect harmony in himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And there is this, these three things that happened and, and they're beautiful. God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. This is the, the way of creation. This God who needed nothing for his glory created. He spoke into existence all that is. And it was good. It was right. Now, in his creation, God made two creatures that were similar but different. Two creatures that had a sense of being, a sense of identity, and a capacity to choose right from wrong. And those were human beings and angels. Human beings and angels. There are similarities in one sense, but there's a vast difference in other ways. Humans are different than angels in that we were made in the image of God. And we were given as image bearers of God a particular or unique glory and honor. This is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. So God made us, for now, a little lower than the angels. In his image, these two beings, angels and humans, were made for the glory of God. But at some point, Satan, the devil, the highest angel in, in, the, in the order decided he wanted to be worshiped, decided he didn't want to serve God. He wanted his own kingdom. And the Bible says there was war in heaven. This is Revelation chapter 12, verse seven. Now war arose in heaven. Michael, that is the angel of God and his angels fighting against the dragon. That is the devil. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he, that is the devil, was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. That is 
the devil and the demons, one third of the demons, that is one third of the angelic hosts that revolted against God became demons. Demons are fallen angels. One third of them followed the devil and they were cast out. Verse nine, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And since then, the devil has been at work with these demonic forces, undermining the authority of God, robbing God of glory, seeking to build his own kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God. Now, our first parents, our federal representatives, Adam and Eve, they were deceived by the serpent with the cunning deceit of the devil, and the world fell and is now under the dominion of the devil. The world fell. We were given dominion. We were, we were commanded by God. We were in the garden. We were in harmony. There was, the, the garden was a specific place on the planet. We were, as, as ordered by God, we were to, to, to work that garden and it was to spread and to expand to cover the entirety of the, of the world. And we were to produce offspring that in that peace with God, peace within and peace with, the, with others were to, were to cover the, the planet, but that's not what happened. We submitted our dominion to the devil and darkness reigned. So when Christ came, the devil was able to make this offer. If you've ever studied the temptation of Christ, you, you, you saw this. It's very important that we see it now. This is Luke chapter four, verse five. Look what he offered. And the devil took him, that is Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me. How? When we fell, we submitted ourselves to his lie. And now the world is under his dominion and he now has power. It has been delivered to me. But look what he says. And I give it to whom I will. So here's the offer. Look at verse seven. The devil said, if then, if you, Jesus, then will worship me, it will all be yours. Think about what he was offering. He was offering Jesus dominion without the cross. He was offering Jesus dominion without the resurrection. What he was saying is, you can be king. You can bring order. You can rule a broken world. But, but Jesus wasn't having it. No, Jesus, Jesus rejected that offer. And instead, Jesus defeated sin and death. Instead, he, he became the ruler over all who repent and believe the gospel. This is back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his, his time is short. We now live in a broken world. We're consistently and constantly being accused by the devil. We're always being tempted by him, by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and all of his demons. We are in a spiritual war. But here's the good news. The victory has already been won. All who repent and believe the gospel gain the life of Christ, forgiveness in Christ. And so now we are right with God, peace with God, peace within, peace with others. And now we're a part of the story of God. We know that the Bible is in four parts. Can you say out loud with me, what are the four parts? They are creation. So we are now a part of the eternal story of God. Creation and fall, but God did not abandon us there. Instead, he chose to come and rescue us. And one day he's going to restore all things. And we understand that reality using three circles. God's design was in creation. The fall occurred because of sin, which created brokenness. But the rescue has come because Jesus has come. The gospel is true. If we will repent, that is stop trusting in ourselves, believe in what Christ has accomplished. We're now free to pursue and recover God's design. We are now free to pursue and recover the victory, the harmony, the peace that is provided in Christ Jesus. We can experience it in this life, not fully. 
we will fully and finally experience that in heaven. We'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks when we go to Philippians chapter one, verse six. But today we need to understand we are in a battle, but the battle has been won. Christ's victory is over all. Until he returns, there will be difficulty. This is what 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says about this. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that, and I highlighted this, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Please understand, life is laborious. It's always challenging. It's always difficult. There's hardship that is happening in all of our lives. But we can know that there's been a victory that's been won in in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we have every reason to be confident and hopeful. And our text today teaches us how. How it is we live in this victory as we face our daily battles. God's weapons for spiritual warfare have been revealed. And so now we can see in them what God is doing in the world and in our lives. Three things to write down and remember. And the first one is this. God's weapon for spiritual warfare revealed that we have a real enemy. We have a real enemy. I have found C.S. Lewis to be a huge help to me in in thinking as it pertains to the devil and his army of demons. Because there's a right way and a wrong way to deal with this. There's two extremes that we need to avoid. He said this in Screw Tape Letters, the introduction. If you don't know Screw Tape Letters, you need to know Screw Tape Letters and you need to read Screw Tape Letters. It is very helpful as it pertains to spiritual warfare. It says there are two equal and opposite errors into which our human race can fall about the devils, where we can fail, where we can come short. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hell a materialist or a magician with the same delight. They love the secularists who say there's only a material world who ignores the reality of the spiritual war we're in. They also love the one who gets so enwrapped with the work of the demons that that they dare to speak to them and give focus to them rather than to Christ. Here's the point that we need to remember. God is greater than the devil and all the demons. The devil and the demons are not equal in power to God. Remember this, the devil is in one place right now. He is a created being. The devil is a fallen angel. He's currently in a single location. He is not all-knowing. He's limited in knowledge. He's limited in power. Our God is all-knowing. He is all-present. He is all-powerful. There's no contest in this. The difference is, and the reason why there's a challenge is because we gave dominion to the devil and the devil is now at work, accusing us and tempting us to dishonor God. What we need to know when we suffer any kind of pain is that God has a plan for it. God allows and provides what the scriptures call thorns. After we have prayed for their removal, if they remain, We need to trust in the medicinal purpose of the thorns. God has the power to remove them, but we need to trust in his plan, even though, and especially when, they are demonically driven. When they are of demonic origin, you say, what? Yeah, this is is, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7. We would do well to learn from this experience of Paul. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. God allowed this. Look at verse eight. Paul says, three times I pleaded. He prayed with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But look what God's response was in verse nine. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response, well, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. And I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The goal of the gospel is not to make us strong in and of ourselves. The goal of the gospel is to make us dependent upon Christ the all-powerful God 
who loves us and cares for us. We are to trust in him. And we can, we can do that by faith. When we focus on Christ, not on demons, not on circumstances, what will we do? Verse 10, we will be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We will be able to say, as the apostle did in Philippians 4, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. We need God's strength to fight the battles that we're in. We fight those battles not by focusing on our circumstances or the, the origins of them, but by focusing on Christ. Never forget what the devil is. Never forget what the demons are. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they are frenemies. Do you know this name, frenemies? It's, it's a construct, if you will. Frenemy is a mixture of the, of, of, the, of the, I shouldn't say world, it should say word, friend, and enemy. Someone who prins, pretends to be a friend, but who is actually an enemy hoping to cause harm. That's what the devil does. He pretends to be our friend. That's what the flesh does. It pretends to want something good for us, all the while hoping something terrible happens to us. I've seen this happen with children. I've seen this happen with adults. Oh, we're friends. We're good friends. I just love you so much. Meanwhile, I hope she falls on her face. Hey, I hope you win. Good luck. I hope they lose. I am so sick of them winning everything. As someone said this morning, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? That's what a frenemy is. It's someone who pretends to be your friend, but ultimately is your enemy. And here's what we need to understand about the devil. He doesn't want any of us to be ha happy and healthy. He doesn't want any of us to be successful, but he will tolerate it if it will get us to turn away from Christ. So many people in Western culture in particular turn away from Christ because they're happy and healthy. As a matter of fact, think about if most of your prayers were answered, where that would leave you and would you actually have the faith to continue on? See, the devil is happy for us to be happy and to have everything we want so long as we turn our backs on God. Sooner or later, he knows that treason will come with the consequences. But in the meantime, he's happy to have us turn away from the Lord. We must be mindful of this frenemy and we must see him for what he is. And how do we know that we're seeing him right? Verse 11 is when we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The scheme of the devil is to get us to turn our backs on God. And when our perception is right, verse 12, we realize we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, your, your greatest, our greatest enemy is not other human beings. Here's the fact of the matter. I put it on the screen to remind you again. All human beings are fighting a battle in quiet desperation. Friends, those people that you think are so worried about you, they are too worried about everything else going on. You're just a detail that, that they hope to somehow get delight in. And that's why hurt people hurt people. That's why scared people cause so much pain. That our race of, of human, we are dangerous people. But our enemy is not other human beings. Our enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we need to be mindful of the victory we have in Christ and realize that, that, that we have help. Second thing to write down and remember, God's weapon for spiritual warfare, uh, they reveal that we have a, a real defense. Now, now, please lean in on this. We are fighting a spiritual battle, but God has provided. Look at verse 13. The armor, the whole armor of God. So we can defend ourselves that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and doing all, look at the goal here, you might underline that, to stand firm. We are not to go out and create our own victory. We are to stand firm in the victory that Jesus has already won. Stand, therefore, it says, verse 14, stand in the whole armor of God. Now, let me encourage you, if that's your Bible, to write this right next to that, to remember this, because so many folks, I've read some commentaries this week, and they get so caught up in the mechanisms of the, of the armor. Listen, the whole armor of God is Jesus. 
When you're looking at those, those different attributes, you're looking at the attributes of Jesus. What we are being told is to put on Jesus, to receive Jesus. This is John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God has provided Jesus our rescue. We must receive him. We must put on Christ. Why? Because of what he is. What is he? Verse 14. He's our truth. Our truth. Having fastened on the belt of truth. Look at the, fur, look at the verb form. Having fastened. It's already done. We've already received Christ. Look at verse uh, 14 again. He is our righteousness. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we receive the righteousness of Christ. When you receive Christ, you get credit for his holiness so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees you clothed in Jesus. He is our peace. Look at verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. He is our faith's object. Look at verse 16. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. He is our salvation. Look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. He is the word of God. Verse 17 again. And take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In Christ, in Christ, we have victory because he has satisfied the righteous demands of God's law. In Christ, there's nothing else to bring judgment upon. There, the just wrath of God is now off of us because it was placed on Christ. You know this one. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. What, what, what did God do for us? For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What, what does that look like? You know, right now, maybe you've heard about this. There's a bunch of wildfires up in Canada. Have y'all heard about these wildfires that are going on up there? Even last week, you noticed that our air was a little thick. This is a picture just a couple of weeks ago that was in New Jersey. That's from the wildfires. Now, interestingly, one of the ways that they are dealing with these wildfires, they're doing what is called a controlled burn. What does that mean? As the fire is approaching... They are burning out what would be burned by the fire. So guess what's happening? As the fire is coming to that area that's already been burned, the fire dies because there's nothing else to consume. Jesus Christ is our controlled burn. Jesus Christ has taken the full wrath of God and he has satisfied it. So that when the just wrath of God, when all that, that, that is harmful and hurtful comes upon us, it's already been satisfied in Jesus Christ. There's nothing left to burn. It's all been consumed in Jesus Christ. He is our victory. He is our savior. He is our armor. He is our protector. He is our victory. Does that make sense? That's why we put him on. Because he is the, he is the win. And when we are in him, we are saved. And, and in him, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We stand in him. We are free in him. We are victorious in him. We are safe in him. Does he provide thorns? Yes, for a medicinal purpose to our soul. Does, does he allow hardship? Yes. So teach us to depend on him and not ourselves. But we are not victims. We are victors in Christ Jesus. And third thing, write it down. We have a real helper. Not only do we have Christ and his victory, we have help. We have a helper. What are we to do? Look at verse 18. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, Keep alert and with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. We are to pray, but look how in the spirit. Last summer, um, I was leaving. I was mindful of this because I, th I think it happened like a week, this week, a year ago. Uh, I went out to my car and my car wouldn't start. 
And, and I, I, I saw Gary Madison. You can't miss that yellow Jeep, you know, where he's, wherever he is. It's like, a, and I, I called him and said, Gary, you got to come back. You got to help me. And so he came back. He said, what's going on? I said, the car won't start. I said, everything about the car, the vehicle itself is fine. I just don't have any power. So you know what he did? He jumped my battery. He brought life to that battery. And you know what happened? The car started. You know what's crazy? Since then, it has continued to run. The battery that was there needed life. And now it's able to run. So it is for all of us. We need the ignition of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be born again. The Spirit of God gives us life. And the vehicle by which we experience that is prayer. So by faith, we cry out to God and we say, oh, God, save me. Forgive me for my sin. Take over my life. And then we ask him, God, guide me, provide for me, lead me, sustain me. And the victory is there because it's been provided in Jesus Christ. And we pray. This is why God sent him. This is John 14, 16. Jesus said, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit has come to give us life so we can be born again. It's the ignition of life. The vehicle of prayer enables us to receive this by faith, to live in this victory of Christ. And sometimes you don't even know what to pray. If you notice that sometimes all you can do is just groan, the Holy Spirit is there. This is Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He guides us. He, he, sometimes, here's, here's, here's some of your prayers. Here's, here's some of my prayers. Oh, and the Lord knows, and, and that is interpreted, and he leads us by prayer. And we have this strength in our Father, who is God, and this victory in our, our Savior, who is Jesus, and this power that is the Spirit. But are we, are we experiencing victory? There's a little kid, a little boy, had this huge rock. He couldn't pick it up. His dad said, pick it up, son kept struggling. He said, dad, I can't pick it up. He said, you're not using all your strength. He said, dad, I'm using everything. He said, no, you're not because you haven't asked me. He said, I am your strength and I will carry this for you. And this is the word of God to us today. Whatever burden you're bearing, whatever hurt that has happened, whatever you've got going on, you were not made to carry that. Give it to your Father. Let him lift it in the victory of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I know. Some of you can't because you're not Christians and you're on your own. And the wrath of God is coming. But if you will trust in Christ, the wrath of God is satisfied. The Spirit of God is alive. And the Lord will hear you. And he will be your help and strength. Do you need to call on them today? We'll have care leaders here at the front. We're gonna pray. You're welcome to come and pray. Let's stand together as we prepare to do that. Lord God, we are so grateful for your kindness to us. You created all things for your glory and they were meant to be good, but we messed them up. But in your grace, you did not abandon us. And in your grace, we can have new life. And in that life, we can overcome your enemy and ours. And Lord, I pray for some who are here today who are all on their own. They have no hope in God. And I pray today that it will change. I pray today they'll come and talk with me in the hall or a leader here at the front, someone before they go. And Lord, I know that there are many like me in this place who need to just kneel today and say, God, help me. Help me face this challenge. Help me, help me lift this, carry this for me, Lord. I need you. Hear the prayers of your people as we praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.